Good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Mariela Colon, and I'm a librarian in the Civic, Cultural, and Literary Unit of Chicago Public Library. And I'm so pleased to host tonight's program. We would first like to start with our land acknowledgement here at the library. Chicago is the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Odoa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi Nations. Many other tribes like the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sac, and Fox also call this area home. Located at the intersection of several great waterways, the land naturally became a site of travel and healing for many tribes. American Indians continue to call this area home, and now Chicago is home to the sixth largest urban American Indian community that still practices their heritage and traditions and care for the land and waterways. Today, Chicago continues to be a place that calls many people from diverse backgrounds to live and gather here. Despite the many changes the city has experienced, both our American Indian and the Chicago Public Library community see the importance of the land and this place that has always been a city home to many diverse backgrounds and perspectives. So tonight's event is a part of our Voices of Justice speaker series, which is a slate of programs that will engage authors and thought leaders that spark conversation on the topic of social justice. The series builds on the library's rich history in curating events that are responsive to the interests of our communities. Tonight's event presents a topic that highlights intersectionality, specifically women's history, indigenous people, and science with Latinx diasporas. We will be monitoring the chats on both our YouTube and Facebook feeds, so as the program progresses, please feel free to put questions for the speaker there. Additionally, the presenter will ask for some audience participation while using Menti. Today's speaker is Dr. Jessica Hernandez. Dr. Jessica Hernandez, Mayo, Maya Chorti, and Zapotec environment scientist and founder of environmental agency Piña Sol, introduces and contextualizes indigenous environmental knowledge and proposes a vision of land stewardship that heals rather than displaces, that generates rather than destroys. She breaks down the failures of Western defined conservatism and shares alternatives, citing the restoration work of urban indigenous people in Seattle, her family's fight against eco-terrorism in Latin America and holistic land management approaches of indigenous groups across the continent. Despite the undeniable fact that indigenous communities are among the most affected by climate devastation, indigenous science is nowhere to be found in mainstream environmental policy or discourse. Tonight's topic is so important to present into the environmental justice discourse, and we're so pleased to present her here to our Chicago Public Library audience. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Hernandez. Thank you for hosting me here today. So before I begin my presentation, I would also like to acknowledge the indigenous lands where I'm presenting from. I'm presenting from the Duwamish lands, also the shared waters of the Coast Salish peoples, both past, present, and future. And as you know, because we have an audience of so many um, coming from many territories, I would like you to, you know, type in the chat what indigenous lands you're calling from. Thank you. So I'd like to start my presentations by always asking the audience, can one indigenous person speak for all indigenous peoples? So take 30 seconds and reflect on this question and then type in your answer so that we can move forward in the presentation. So can one indigenous person speak for all indigenous peoples? So thank you for your participation. And the answer is no, right? So I think that it's important for me to remind everyone that I'm speaking on behalf of my indigeneity and also my knowledge systems that are very place-based. So, you know, as Mariela mentioned, there is a lot of intersectionalities that are manifested in many identities. And that also includes the indigenous identity where our cultural traditions are very place-based. So I'm speaking on behalf of my lived experiences as a Maya Chorti and Zapotec woman who is displaced within you know, the United States. So if I were to introduce myself in short, in three short phrases, I will say that I'm an indigenous woman and scientist. I'm also a community author, I mean, a community advocate and also an author. So now I wanna you know, allow the audience to also introduce themselves in three short phrases. So please feel free to type them in the chat and then um, 
that way we can get to know one each one another in this conversation. So take the next 20 seconds to introduce yourself in three short phrases. So thank you for that. So um, given that you know this is a conversation about Women's History Month, it's important for me to acknowledge that I come from a matriarchal society, which is the Zapotec Nation from my maternal side. So a matriarchal society is just a social system in which women hold the primary power positions in roles of authority. In a broader sense, it can also extend to more authority, social privilege, and control property. So I think that it, this is like very important for me because it grounds the ways that I was taught and raised in my household where women hold the leadership in our family dynamics, where our matriarchs are the elders that we respect and listen to. And one of those elders that has kind of weaved into the first banana leaves, my book is my grandmother, right? She was the matriarch of our family. And it's something that, you know, we continue to follow to this day. This it does not mean that every Zapotec Pueblo actually follows a matriarchal society, given that, you know, patriarchy through religion and societal norms has also infiltrated our communities. But the Zapotec Pueblo where I come from and my, you know, we were raised in is actually one of the matriarchal societies that's still living today. And as an indigenous woman, right, especially coming from a matriarchal society, one of the components that's very, very important for, for us to center in this conversation is ecofeminism. So ecofeminism is a branch of feminism that sees environmentalism and the relationship woman and the earth as foundational to its analysis and practices. So, you know, I wanted to take the next minute to read an excerpt from my book that basically describes what ecofeminism is and um, contextualizes it to my indigenous communities. So it reads, ecofeminism, indigenous women's rights. Given the strong relationship in indigenous women have with their environments, it's important that indigenous women are brought to the forefront of environmentalism. As societies throughout the Americas, we must advocate for the recognition of indigenous women as movements are not easy to lead and require a lot of work, time, and dedication. This is why it's important to start lifting and supporting indigenous women more, something that indigenous men also have to do. Ecofeminism looks at the woman nature nexus and through the testimonies and analysis provided in this chapter, we can bear witness to the ecofeminism embedded in indigenous communities across the Americas. Ecofeminism aims to interpret relationships women have with their environments and explore how these can be brought to the forefront of environmentalism. In a way, it's the antithesis of patriarchy that exists in environmentalism. This, this patriarchy Patriarchy is why men are the only ones uplifted as the knowledge holders, seekers, and scientists when it pertains to our environments. In many indigenous communities like the Zapotec, Mistec, and Triqui community, it is an indigenous woman who holds more knowledge about their environment, nature, as women are the nurturers of our people, environments, and communities. This nurturing is not only focused on childbearing, but also supporting you, supporting other women, and supporting our matriarchs, elders. Women in our community have a reciprocal relationship with nature. This relationship does not stay only within us or our environments, but is also expressed through our traditional huipiles, textiles, textiles, and embroideries. As a result, indigenous women deeply feel any loss to our environment and it ultimately impacts our future generations. These deep feelings are why we continue to be leaders in many environmental, climate, and food justice movements. This is also what fuels our responsibilities, commitments, and artisanal skills that are not only related to our communities and families, but also our environments. Ecofeminism asks for respect to our ancestral knowledge and way of life, especially the knowledge Indigenous women carry. As indigenous women, we do not seek to be treated better, but to be granted the same rights and treatment as men are granted without having to advocate or fight for those rights. For me, ecofeminism is an integral component of my indigeneity, 
This is why as Zapotec women, we also braid our hair in the style of a crown. This crown is supposed to connect us to the earth, you know, from the earth to the skies. It is also meant to resemble the sun that nourishes us, our crops, and is one of our gods. It also resembles the flowers that we are within our, you know, that are within our communities in matriarchal society. My grandmother always told me that this is the crown, the crown our environments provided for indigenous women. And this is why our braids and the trenza de reina, queen's braid, is how we braid our hair. So this kind of passage kind of manifests how indigenous women are actually integrated or interconnected with our environment and how that can be something that can be described through ecofeminism, the theory that, as I mentioned, kind of connects women and earth and kind of, you know, advocates for that relationship. However, we know that patriarchy continues to kind of manifest in our societies. And one of the questions that I wanted the audience to reflect on is how does patriarchy currently impact our relationships to land. So take the next 10 seconds to kind of reflect on this question. How does patriarchy currently impact our relationships to land? So one of the ways that patriarchy actually intersects with our relationship with land is that you know, because Mother Earth is given this like female embodiment, it kind of allows us as humans, especially men to own the land, right? It kind of separates that relationship that we should have with our environment because we no longer have an equal movement or status with our lands. We're actually, you know, in the hierarchy, we have more power, especially if we are men, cisgender men, to own the land, right? To be able to decide what you do with that land. And I think one of the teachings that my grandmother always passed um, to me and reminded me of, and that it's also integrated in the book, is that when all men learn how to respect a woman, they will also learn how to respect the most powerful of them all, which is Mother Earth. And I think that, you know, because of these components of patriarchy, especially given that, you know, it's something important to mention during Women's History Month, um, we also have to look and reflect on how our relationships with nature or our land, as we had stated before, has been fractured because not just a patriarchy, but all these Western doctrines that kind of continue to determine how we actually view ourselves as humans and a species in relationship to our environments. So one of the premises of the um, freshman analyst the book is that nature protects us as long as we protect nature. And I think that that's one of the inherited teachings that many indigenous communities across the Americas or Abia Yala actually embody that nature protects us as long as we protect nature. So I wanted you know, us to take a minute to kind of reflect on how strongly this teaching act actually currently aligns with us. So the teaching being nature protects us as long as we protect nature. So take the next couple of seconds to kind of, you know, reflect on this. And you don't necessarily have to type it, but you, if you want to also participate, um, please, you know, state in the chat how strongly does this teaching currently align with you? So thank you for your participation. And I think that, you know, in, in regards to our responses of how, you know, strongly this teaching of nature protecting us as long as we protect nature aligns with us is that we also have to question why, why we, you know, gave the responses that we had or why did we reflect or think of the things that actually came to mind when we were reflecting at that, right? Like what has um, fractured our relationship with nature? You know, we have discussed patriarchy, especially how, it has um, fractured, you know, how we view land, especially our mother earth, given that, you know, she embodies a, a female identity. So when we talk about, you know, how nature protects us as long as we protect nature, it's also important to mention that as indigenous peoples, we have a spiritual connection to the lands. Um, and this is because we are a part of nature. Many of our creation stories, and I will read a passage on our creation stories, kind of manifest that our creator created us, you know, built our human bodies, our ancestors from the local plants and animals that were found in our region. 
This is why also a traditional regalia or clothing is also made from the environmental resources that we have, because this is like a component of how nature is a part of us. And of course, this relationship is obviously place-based, right? So for instance, uh, indigenous community from the state of Washington, coastalish communities will have a different relationship of, with salmon than um, a commu indigenous community of Mexico where salmon is not necessarily a species that is found there. So I think that, you know, it's important to also mention how our relationships with nature are very place-based, right? Because our environments are distinct and different. So I wanted to also read a passage on that kind of um, describes our creation stories and how we see that nature is a part of us. So it reads, our plants and animal relatives. This separation between humans and our environment, including both plants and animals, prevents us from seeing them as our relatives. This is why we continue to place economic values on them. And it's indeed, is, is as if we indeed saw them as our relatives, there will be no price tag attached to them. It is no surprise that as an indigenous peoples, we see our plant and animal species as relatives, hence why many plants and animals play an important role in our creation stories. These creation stories differ among community tribes and pueblos as we are distinct and not monolithic. For example, for us Zapotec people, our creation story states that our ancestors were born from the trees and jaguars. Our ancestors were created by our deities inside caves by utilizing natural resources to create our people. We came from earth and this explains the strong connection that we have with Mother Earth as Zapotec people. Given that we are the children of deities, we believe that our afterlife, we return to the clouds and our spirits feed the earth with the most essential resource of them all, water. This shows that we understand that our role on earth does not end when we are gone as we are continuing to provide water to our plant and animal relatives in the form of rain. This is why we call ourselves the cloud people, and this is the literal translation from our names, Benisa, among other variations based on the Zapotec variant each Pueblo speaks. This means that plants and animals are indeed our relatives and we came from them, and this is why we continue to protect and advocate for their rights as well. Our creation stories focus on native plants to our region and animals. And this demonstrates that we always knew that we had to live harmoniously and, um, and in strong relationships with them since time and memoria. Unlike Western European cultures that have commodified all natural resources, including animals, when we consume animals, we continue to ask for their permission and protection before we consume them. However, these are not beliefs or values Western cultures have as the agricultural systems focus on breeding animals for consumption in masses, making them undergo inhumane practices so that we can continue to have our beef and other meat products. So it's important, right, to continue to kind of emphasize the spiritual connection that we have, you know, the majority of indigenous peoples have with our lands and um, plants and animal relatives. And that's because, you know, in the in a way, they play an important role in our creation stories. So, you know, given the presentation and how it focuses on indigenous women and indigenous peoples, one of the things that, you know, we cannot forget to mention is colonization, right? Especially the impacts colonization had on our communities. So, you know, we, if you have seen this image before, this is an image of manifest destiny, right? And it kind of embodies that Western religion that was introduced and spread across the Americas. And manifest destiny was a widely held cultural belief in the 19th century that the United States, you know, in the United States that American settlers were destined to um, expand across North America. And this was kind of, you know, a cultural belief that was rooted in religion because this authority to expand across the Americas and spread Western religion was a message that came from their God. So I wanted, you know, us to take the next seconds to also kind of reflect on how did colonization impact indigenous peoples, right? Because oftentimes um, we tend to forget how colonization 
impacted us, especially our indigenous communities in the past. And we do not form those strong relationships or connections to how we are still seeing settler colonialism impact indigenous peoples today. So you can answer this question based on the past tense or in the present tense. Um, so how did colonization or how does colonization continue to impact indigenous peoples today? So take the next second so that we can you know, get um, some audience participation. Well, thank you for your participation. So one of the readings that I wanted to also include is, you know, that kind of explains how did colonization impact indigenous peoples. And this is through the references of what we know as Western or modern science, right? So for those of you who actually wrote, you know, about the introduction of Western sciences, this passage kind of builds more on that narrative. So invalidating our indigeneity. Ironically, our firsthand experiences as indigenous peoples are invalidated by professors, scientists, and research, researchers who maintain power and privilege in these educational systems. While exploration is what drives Western science, the exploration and questioning of our environment has already been done by our ancestors. The knowledge our ancestors formulated has been passed down through oral stories, songs, prayers, and other traditions. Thus, we hold a powerful indigenous knowledge or indigenous science as well, I refer to it. This is the same indigenous science that can heal our indigenous plants because we have been formulating our knowledge systems longer than settlers have on our lands. My academic journey has been bestowed within the environmental sciences. An example I wanna share that demonstrates how indigenous science is different is how we view invasive species. The Western sciences teach us that invasive species or plants are pests unwanted or do not belong in this landscape. However, to us, invasive species or plants are displaced like many of us. They were forced from their native, native lands and like many of us had to adapt to a new environment. Like banana trees, we are forced to uproot ourselves from our native lands and have to adapt to new environments. Some invasive species have thrived so well that many folks think they are native species because of the abundance of them in many landscapes. While not forgetting the negative impacts they also have on some environments, some of our indigenous communities have learned how to live with them. And an example that, you know, for example, we Oaxacan and Salvadorian folks use a lot of banana leaves to make tamales and other traditional foods. While bananas are not native to our homelands, they have become a relatives that continue to nourish us in various forms. Like banana trees, for those of us who are displaced from our homelands, we build on a strong foundation, our roots, and establish our new ecosystems and communities in the lands we now reside on. Our resilience is adaptive, adapted to our current environment, and banana leaves serves as a metaphor to our descendants. We are both strong and resilient despite being displaced and have become an essential component of indigeneity within the U.S. context. context. So, you know, one of the reasons why I'm talking about invasive species is that, you know, it's a Western construct, especially when it comes to Western or modern science. So as we know, Western um, science actually follows a linear method, right? Known as a scientific method, where we start with a question, then do a hypothesis, then conduct an experiment, make observations, do the data analysis, and draw conclusions. However, indigenous science, which is, you know, kind of like the central focus of my book, Fresh Banana Leaves, puts spirituality at the core center of that. So oftentimes, you know, I'm asked the question, how can we integrate indigenous science in this environmental project. And one of the things that, you know, I like to remind folks is that you cannot integrate indigenous science without also including indigenous peoples. And that's because, you know, the foundation of indigenous science is our spirituality, right? And I think that spirituality is something that you cannot remove from people. Indigenous science, you know, looks more like a spider web. It's more of a holistic framework, unlike, you know, Western sciences that follows a linear way of thinking. And we also integrate some of that Western science tools, right? So we don't work against Western science, even though Western science sometimes works against indigenous peoples. We also embody indigenous science through our ceremonies, our code of ethics, our social norms, rules, animals, medicinal knowledge, 
And every indigenous science is very place-based. So the indigenous science that I hold as a Zapotec woman is different from the indigenous science that, you know, my Maya Chorty people also hold. And I think that, you know, that's one of the premises to also kind of uplift and center in this discussion. So, you know, you can take the next 10 seconds to reflect on what are some of the differences you notice between indigenous science and Western and modern science. And I think that, you know, some of the differences is that Western science is more linear versus indigenous science is more, is more holistic. And one of the things, right, that we have to do is that we have to unlearn and relearn, right? Because the ways that we have been taught, especially for those of us who have been educated under the Western sciences, it's, it's to think more of, you know, that linear way of thinking, right? Because that follows, you know, aligns with the scientific method where everything is mostly binary, even in the forms of education. And as a result of that, you know, one of the metaphors that I like to use when kind of also describing indigenous science versus Western modern science is that indigenous science is looking at the completed puzzle as opposed to Western science that is looking at one or two puzzle pieces and it's trying to connect those pieces, um, those you know puzzle pieces, but sometimes it has a hard time, right? And when we create solutions, especially when it comes to solutions to mitigate or adapt to climate change, we tend to forget to look at the world more holistically, right? Especially um, when we talk about climate injustices as it pertains to communities of color. And as a result, right, we have to unlearn and, and learn, relearn as well. So moving forward, so to conclude, you know, this quick presentation before we go into the q and I would like to, you know, ask the audience, what is one thing you have to unlearn or relearn as it pertains to indigenous peoples? And I also want you to think about some of the actions you can actually take um, to, you know, do that unlearning and relearning and how your positionality allows you to do so. So I think that, you know, that's the overall message I want to leave to the audience or the question so that, you know, sometimes um, it's important for us to make these reflections. So any knowledge that, you know, we picked up on, we also can create actions moving forward, especially we want to advocate for climate, racial justice, social justice, and, you know, kind of dismantle the isms that exist in our current society. So I wanted to thank you and I will pass the mic to um, my co-host. Thank you so much. It was just, it's so important. And, and reading this book really sort of opened up like a new framework without it being so like, like, you know, we're used to the steps of the scientific method. It's one step, one, two, you can't skip any. It's always done that way. And so like, there's no really, there's no real way to put people into it. It's just sort of, it's there. It exists regardless if people do. So it's just understanding that it was just really eye-opening to present this idea of indigenous. And as a product of going through the university system, I, I experienced that sort of Western style education and limited to the point where being Puerto Rican in Chicago, I didn't really get a Puerto Rican history until I reached university. So it's sort of understanding, you know, the educational system, its role, and then finding ways of adapting to it and unlearning, but also relearning self. So thank you so much for writing this book. It's awesome. And I'm going to go to a, a few questions. Um, so in your book, you describe conservation as a practice that didn't exist pre-colonization. And can you expand upon why that is? Yeah, so I think that when we look at the history of conservation, we know that conservation was created, you know, it's a movement in the United States um, by the president of that time who wanted to, in a way, protect or kind of put in a box certain landscapes that he saw beautiful that he kind of wanted to protect and also create, you know, create in a lens, you know, kind of recreate the landscape as, you know, something outside of like the natural component where he was kind of like putting something in the glass um, in the glass box to, for others to enjoy. And I think that that's what sparked the conservation movement, right? right? Was the integration or building of national parks. And as a result of that, um, oftentimes, you know, many national parks have a violent history, especially when it pertains to how they were, they remove indigenous peoples, because, you know, there was indigenous peoples living in every um, land or every, you know, kind of everywhere in the United States. Um, and because, you know, in in names, you know, in terms of conservation, there was this kind of disconnection between humans and nature. So that's why 
um, there was, you know, violent removals of indigenous peoples from those areas, right, that were converted into national parks. And we even see today how, you know, despite, and I think this is like a known um, stats is, you know, despite indigenous peoples making 5% of the world, um, they steward over 80% of the world's biodiversity. And I think that that demonstrates the importance of indigenous knowledge and the protection or in a way the relationships that we hold with nature where we're not extracting more or taking more than we than we need. And you know, you know, as someone, you know, who, you know, who comes from Puerto Rico yourself, right? It's also important to also mention that um 50% of the world's biodiversity is located in what's known as Latin America today. And I think that oftentimes when we talk about environmental justice, climate justice, or social justice within you know, the environmental movement, many people forget that you know, 50% of the world's biodiversity is currently located in Latin America, which of course you know, includes um, Central America, South America, Mexico, the Caribbean, many of the islands. And you know, we continue to see how as a result of that, when our indigenous leaders from those regions go against, you know, extractive energy companies or other entities are trying to destroy, you know, that 50% of the world's biodiversity, they're met with violence. So I think that, you know, going back to the past, conservation was something that wasn't needed. And we still see how many of our indigenous communities are still stewarding, caretaking for, you know, most of the world's biodiversity without, you know, necessarily making it into a marine protected area or a national park, which is, you know, the premises of what conservation is today. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, so I don't think pe many people realize that the indigenous tribes in Latin America do not have that sort of legal status that some tribes in the United States do. So how do you find that makes it much more difficult for organization of purposes and, and stuff? So, and it makes it dangerous and stuff. So I was wondering uh, how, what kind of barriers do you perceive that the status brings on? Yeah, so for many of our indigenous pueblos and communities and nations from Latin America, you know, like you mentioned, we don't have treaty rights. And I think that that's, that's the, you know, the main reason why that tends to be the case is because, you know, when we talk about the history of colonization, Columbus, you know, like Christopher Columbus, he didn't necessarily land in the United States, you know, what we know as the United States first, he landed in the Caribbean, right, within many islands where, you know, he, um, you know, they introduce, you know, all the diseases that kind of, you know, um, plummeted many of the indigenous communities populations like the Taino and other indigenous communities from those islands. And I think that um, oftentimes when we talk about, you know, indigeneity and we relate Christopher Columbus, you know, 1492, we kind of disconnected from the impacts they actually had among indigenous communities of Latin America. And as a result of that, right, colonization, was like a timeline, right? Where they were expanding across the Americas and clearly Latin America was impacted first. So by the time, you know, they were able to settle in what we know as the United States and Canada, indigenous communities were able to, in a way, create those treaties. But I think that that doesn't um, negate the fact that many of our indigenous pueblos or communities are actually advocating for the protection of our environment. And many, as a result, many, um, Native American tribes or First Nations peoples from the United States and Canada are still kind of looking at us for examples, right? One of the movements that has garnered many attentions and that many Indigenous communities try to, you know, study in a way is the Zapatista movement, right? Which was Indigenous women-led, where many of the Maya pueblos in Southern Mexico, you know, in the state of Chiapas were actually tired of being oppressed. So they decided to, you know, raid the capital of Chiapas and burn the land deeds, right? So that they can reclaim their lands. And I think that, you know, it shows how our indigenous sovereignty is more of a sustainable sovereignty where we don't necessarily rely on those political doctrines or documents and we kind of take it in our own hands. But yet again, you know, as a result of that, Latin America continues to be the deadliest place or the most dangerous place for many indigenous leaders who happen to be also women, right? Or non-binary, our women are actually leading these movements. But yet even for like the Zapatistas, when we look at the Zapatista movement, the person who became the face was Comandante Marcos, right? As this gender man 
despite you know women being the center and the leaders behind that movement so i think that you know that in a way also shows how patriarchy is manifested in our indigenous movements where you know we can be doing all the work as women but yet it's the men who's going to be you know become the face of that movement despite you know him being more of a follower as opposed to the leading that you know we did as females can't escape the patriarchy <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, cultural knowledge is lost through traditional Western style education. What remedies do you see that are effective in retaining and disseminating that knowledge, especially when it comes to younger audiences? Yeah, so, you know, oftentimes when, you know, you probably can relate to this, when we go through these like Western educational systems, sometimes we know we feel like we don't belong. And that's something that we should be feeling because, you know, education was created as an assimilation tool to assimilate indigenous peoples coming into these systems, right? We have the history of boarding schools, which were actually um, created across Americas, right? In Mexico, we had them. In Latin America, we also had them. And also, you know, in the United States, you know, they have a history that, that you know, it's, it's very, it's not in the past, right? Because oftentimes when we talk about, you know, these um, social injustices are part of our histories, many people tell us to get over it because it's something in the past, but where in reality, it's something that our grandparents or our parents went through. And I think that with Western education, it's important for us, you know, to integrate our indigenous ways of learning also, which can be story, um, storytelling, um, learning from our elders, but yet, you know, sometimes we are forced to get these Western credentials for us to be heard, um, especially in certain fields, right? Because, you know, in order for us to navigate the library, maybe we require a master's in librarian studies or, in a, you know, for us to teach the youth, right, in, academ in these academic settings, we need to get a doctorate so that we can be considered a professor or a lecturer. And I think that, you know, how do we break from that while, knowing that our, you know, that decolonization, especially when it pertains to our, you know, to our environments or our lands will require, you know, many generations, generations work, right? So sometimes it's something that we strive to achieve, but the decolonization means dismantling many layers. It's like peeling an onion, right? There's so many layers that colonialism introduced. And I think that, um, you know, one of those layers is Western education and how it continues to leave our people out of those discourses where, you know, our elders or sometimes our parents, their knowledge is invalidated because they don't hold a master's because they don't hold a doctoral degree. And I think that, you know, we still have to remember that despite going through these colonial systems of, you know, higher education, our people knows what's best for them and they hold a deep knowledge that, you know, it's important for us to also uplift and not forget in that sense. Yeah, and, and the library is right there smack in the middle of the public library. Like history privileges are in word. So what we have on the shelf is what happened when in reality, you know, there's oral history and cultural knowledge from my mom to everyone. So understanding that and how to incorporate that, it, it's definitely incredibly needed to provide an accurate portrait of where, well, how we got to where we are today. We can't figure out where to go next if we don't know where we've been. <laughs> All right. Um, are there other organizations um, you can recommend the audience seek out when learning more about Indigenous science and activism? Yeah, so I recommend the audience to first learn the Indigenous lands that they're actually standing on because, you know, it's often, you know, when we navigate certain spaces, it's sometimes it's not rare for people to not know whose Indigenous lands they're actually living on. So I think that, you know, the best way that I think that people can actually learn um, more about indigenous sciences by learning from the local communities, you know, so for instance, go to native land or Canada and, you know, type your zip code. And then once you learn about, you know, the indigenous peoples whose lands you're residing on, do a Google search because many indigenous communities are leading, you know, um, social justice movements, environmental justice movements, and require a lot of, you know, allies to also join their movements. But yet, you know, not every not every community can garner media attention. And I think that that's the best way to learn from indigenous science is, you know, to make sure that you support indigenous communities, especially local indigenous communities, right? Because sometimes we forget that we try to strive for supporting indigenous peoples outside of, you know, our own backyards, especially the lands that we live on. So I think that that's a great way, right, to, you know, do a good, um, a quick Google search and learn what kind of movements or support those indigenous communities need, because, you know, we have to, in a way, build our relationships with the land and the people, not necessarily the land. So I think that, you know, that's 
those those are the organizations, right? Like the local indigenous tribes or nations that whose lands you're currently living on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, so following a reading of Fresh Banana Leaves, are there other books that you can recommend to our audience um, along the same lines, themes that people might want to check out? Yeah, so I would say Braiding Sweetgrass. I also know Dr. Kyle White, who has a lot of, um, not necessarily books, but more of like um, journals that he writes a lot about environmental and climate justice. He's in Michigan. Um, Braiding Sweetgrass, Dr. Robin Kimmer is, I think, in New York. Um, I think, let me, let me think about the books. Okay. So I, I think I can send a list. So that we Thank can you. Post it. <laughs> That's totally fine. You know, and, and one thing I have considered that's really sort of new to me when, when we're really analyzing is, um, examining the positionality of the author, because you, as you mentioned earlier, like traditional, like research, sociology, philosophy, all of that research is really extractive, especially when it comes to in, indigenous communities and stuff. And so like, I've, I've done the extra work with who, who actually wrote this book and what kind of research processes go then. So, okay. And what was your motivation behind um, my founding Piña Sol? Yeah, so Piña Sol is a small business, um, like a social purpose corporation that kind of um, is a hybrid between consultation, even though I haven't had time to give many consultations, but also selling artesanías. And I think coming from a family that embroiders, that, you know, makes earrings, um, I wanted to support them because um, many of our indigenous artisans, right, they're haggled or they're underpaid for, you know, their artesanías. And I think that that has to do a lot with tourism, while, you know, our people depend on that. Um, you know, during the pandemic, that wasn't necessarily a source of income. So what I do is, you know, I get the artesanías from my relatives and sell them and give them, you know, um, support them in that effort. And then some, you know, they donate part of those, you know, profits to fund local Black and Indigenous-led conservation, environmental, um, soil, whatever, you know, environmental work that um, Black and Indigenous communities are leading, and they don't necessarily have to be a 501c3, you know, nonprofit status. They can just be community members, because I think many of our communities are doing the work to kind of heal our landscapes, but yet when it comes to having those resources, right, whether it be financial, uh, mostly financial, right, to, you know, pay our community members for their work and also get the, you know, the tools that they need to complete the work, they're underfunded, right, and oftentimes, you know, most of the funding that does um, you know, it's allocated for those, you know, environmental work goes to these uh, white-led conservation organizations that do not necessarily work with our people. And I think that that's important. So, you know, it's a small um, growing social purpose corporation and hopefully we can grow it because, you know, we often when we open our micro grant cycles, we get more applications and we can actually fund. So I think that, you know, it's important for us to also mention that as well. Sort of, I mean, as a mutual aid benefit, which we've really some come out of the pandemic, like that's how I've been able, able to identify like smaller organizations because they sort of taken the lead on the block to get, connect people to, you know, mutual aid nearby. So. Okay, so we're sort of at the end. So I was wondering if you had any other, we can sort of wrap up um, if you have any final thoughts reflecting on Women's History Month and um, the work, this very important work and also, teaching me that I had no idea bananas were not indigenous. I just have them <laughs> pasteles and uh -huh. yeah. and all this. And I'm like, but we've always had it in my family. So I had, it just didn't even occur to me. So do you have any other final thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, thank you for having me. And I think that's important for us to continue elevating, especially women's voices and environmentalism. You know, when we talk about environmental justice or even when we look at, you know, climate um, science news, right? We have to question why it's always the two, you know, males who are known as the experts when, you know, it's our women, our indigenous women, our black women, our women of color who are leading these movements, especially as you were mentioning back to mutual aid, right? They're the ones who have, hit the ground going with mutual aids to support those, you know, initiatives that they have started. So I hope that, you know, that inspires people to look at local mutual aids that are also supporting communities directly in terms of, you know, doing that work that it requires for us to hear our landscapes. 
So, so that's about all the time we have for tonight's program. I want to thank Dr. Jessica Hernandez so much for being here. The book is available for purchase. You can find it on our online link from Random House, but we also encourage our watchers to seek out the book at Chicago's many independent booksellers. We also have the book available at our library if you wanted to check it out. This program will continue to be available through our Chicago Public Library YouTube page. So if you know of someone who might have missed the event, please share with them to watch on demand. And this is uh, another program in our Voices of Justice events throughout the year. So please look, be on the lookout for future offerings. Thank you again to Dr. Hernandez and everyone have a wonderful night. Good evening. <laughs>